Was that the Yeah. 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 Good evening. Welcome to the evening worship service of Chesapeake Church of Christ. If you're visiting with us again, we're thankful you're here. You're our honored guests, and please um, stay around so we can get a chance to know you at the end of the service. You will find a white card in the seat in front of you. Uh, please go ahead and fill that out and place it in the basket in the back in the foyer where the contribution is put. Lord willing, we'll meet again Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. for Bible study, and then uh, next Sunday morning, 9.30 for a Bible class, and then 10.30 for worship service. Uh, also, if you're with us on live stream, welcome. I'm not going to go through everything in the announcement sheet. Uh, if you do need it, let us know. Uh, let's continue praying for Betty Ford. Um, 
Rashonda Baines and her foster child Serenity, uh, Sister Kid, and uh, Sister Brooke Richardson. Uh, also, I got a note tonight that David Jones is having trouble with a sinus infection. He asked to uh, be put on the prayer list. Uh, Ladies Day planning meeting will be Tuesday evening at 7 p.m. by Zoom. Uh, Cynthia Benjamin, uh, Thad, and Yolanda Smith will be traveling this week. Birthdays and anniversaries are on the list. Um, Tanisha Wor uh, Wormley's son, Jaleel's kidney labs came back stable. The liver problem is shrinking, so things are improving. Uh, let's keep uh, Carl McCormick, Cheryl Struthers' father, in prayer. And uh, also with the ladies' Bible class, the new class begins Tuesday, May the 3rd at 7 p.m. on Zoom. Let's keep those on our prayer list in our prayers. Uh, the uh, church cleanup will be May 7th instead of yesterday. And then also th this coming Saturday will be the men's meeting. Will that be 8.30? 8.30? Okay, 8.30 Saturday morning. Men's assignment roster for May has been put out by Charles. I am not sure who's participating tonight. I saw uh, James uh, running around uh, making sure everything's covered. I was privileged this morning to make the announcement that uh, Jeremiah and Emily are now engaged. So I'm thankful that I had the opportunity to give the announcements today. So let's congratulate them. If you do have a cell phone, let's put it on vibrate or uh, let's uh, turn it off so we don't interrupt the worship service this morning, excuse me, this evening. Uh, and that's everything I have. Uh, let's have a moment of silence. We'll begin our worship service. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're so again grateful to be able to assemble, to come together and worship this evening. We just thank you for another opportunity. We just pray that everyone has come with thanksgiving in their heart. We just ask your blessings again on, on our service. Father, we lift up all those who were on our prayer list and all those that David mentioned that needed prayer. Serenity, Brooke Richardson, Betty Ford, David Jones, and um, Bob Fountain. We just want to continue to lift those up to you. Father, we pray that everything that we have planned this evening will be pleasing in your sight. We pray that you will be with all those men who will be participating in our service and leading our service. We ask your blessing upon Reginald Trotter as he brings our message today. And we pray that we will have open, open hearts and open ears to listen to the message and be able to take it and hide it in our heart and take it out into a sinful world. And all these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. First song this evening will be number 280, 280. Let's sing all three verses of this one. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea
That song is not in the book. It's Sing Hallelujah to the Lord. We'll sing all verses of this one. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. and minds for the Lord's Supper. For those who were unable to partake this morning, we'll sing number 387. 387. We'll sing all verses of this one. Down at the cross where my Savior died. Down where
Is there anybody tonight that's in need of a communion kit? If so, please raise your hand and we'll have one brought to you. Okay. We set this time aside during our church service to remember the sacrifice that Christ made for us upon the cross so that our sins may be forgiven. In Acts the 20th chapter in verse 7, we see that it was the custom of the apostles to meet on the first day of the week to come together and break bread. And we see that Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper during the feast of the Passover as he ate with his apostles in the upper room. And in Matthew, the 26th chapter, from verses 26 to 29, we see that Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper. And it says, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Let us pray for the bread. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy that you would send your Son, Christ Jesus, to walk amongst the earth to be a living example for us to follow, and that he would be a willing sacrifice upon the cross, offering his body up so that our sins may be forgiven. We seek now to partake of this bread in a manner pleasing unto you, and we ask that you forgive us of our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let us pray for the fruit of the vine. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you with humble hearts and with thanksgiving that, once again, that you would send your Son, Christ Jesus, to be a living sacrifice, that he would willingly give up his life and shed his blood upon the cross so that we may have the opportunity to be washed clean through that blood. We come before you now with humble hearts seeking forgiveness for our sins and thank you for the love and the grace and the mercy that you have shown us. We should partake of this fruit of the vine in a manner pleasing unto you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. This concludes the Lord's Supper. Separate from the Lord's Supper, but not apart from our worship service, is the opportunity that we have to give back a portion of that with which we have been blessed. We're encouraged to give as we have prospered on the first day of the week, just as Paul discusses in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. And it reads, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 15, Paul describes the manner in which we are to give. And it reads, But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work, as it is written. He has dispersed abroad, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness, while you are enriched in everything for all liberality, which causes thanksgiving through us to God. For the administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also is abounding through many thanksgivings to God. While through the proof of this ministry, they glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ and for your liberal sharing with them and all men, and by their prayer for you, who long for you because of the exceeding grace of God in you, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. 
Now, we no longer pass a collection plate, but we do have a basket in the foyer for your offering if you wish to give. You also have the opportunity to give online through the church website or by mailing a check into the church. Let us pray for the offering. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many blessings that you have given us in our lives, and we thank you for the opportunities that you provide us. We seek now to give back a portion of that with which we have been blessed to further your work here at the Chesapeake Church of Christ and to spread your word and to do your will, Lord. We ask that you bless this gift and that you bless those that give with a joyful heart. And we ask that you see that this gift is administered in a manner pleasing it to you to further your work. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Next song this evening will be 603. 603. We'll sing all three verses. Walking alone at even, viewing the skies afar, bidding the darkness come to welcome each silver star. I have a great delight in the wonderful scenes above. God in his power and might is showing his truth and love. Oh, for a home with God, a place in his courts to rest. Sure in a safe abode with Jesus and the blessed. Rest for a weary soul, once redeemed by the Savior's love. tonight we'll sing number 578 578 if you're able please stand with me as we sing this one we'll sing all three verses there's not a friend like the lowly Jesus no not one no
Good evening. Today's scripture reading will be coming from Acts 8, verses 26 through 39. That is, chap- that is Acts 8, verses 26 through 39. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go towards the south along the road which goes, towards, goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot. He was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place is the place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before his shear is silent. So he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation from his life was taken from the earth? So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this, this scripture preached Jesus to him. 
Now as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and baptized him. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so that the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. I took it easy on Jalen uh, this morning, I mean this evening with the scripture reading. Uh, Brother Jeremiah tried to slay him this morning. <laughs> I looked out for my son. <laughs> I want to say good evening to everyone. We're certainly blessed by the God of heaven once again to allow us to assemble here with those of like precious faith. Uh, to come and sing song of praise, hear his word preached, to worship him in spirit and in truth. Indeed, it is a blessing to dwell with brethren in unity and those of like precious faith. Uh, I am delighted to stand before you uh, this evening, first time uh, preaching here at Chesapeake, first time on a live stream. I've been dreading it somewhat, feeling the pressure. But at the same time, I love it at the same time. So uh, nevertheless, I'm here, and I'm just talking right now to get my butterflies in formation, get myself settled before I preach to you this evening. I do have a confession that I need to make, though. Uh, you know, I've been visited this congregation several times, years past, heard many of lessons, uh, partic I mean, come to many gospel meetings, lectureships, and regular services. And I um, heard many uh, good lessons from this very pulpit. But it's a surreal moment for me to stand here tonight. And I told JJ that this morning, and he was like, what? It's like, yes, brother, you, brother, you have no idea. It's just a surreal moment for me. And I... Um, I thank God for it. I do. Uh, Luke wrote in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, uh, he says, Take heed therefore to yourselves and to all the flock over to which the Holy Ghost have made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he had purchased with his own blood. And Paul, there was a strong charge in which he charged the, the elders there at Ephesus and any eldership of the Lord's church any time after. And the three things he said to take heed unto yourselves and to the flock. He said to feed the church of God. And I can speak for my family. I'm pretty sure I, a lot of you other families would echo, but I think the elders here have taken that charge very seriously. I'm very thankful for them. Brethren, we need to pray for our elders. I'm thankful for the deacons as well that serve, but we need to pray for our elders if we want to continue to come here, worship, be fed, and they can keep the nonsense, all of the stuff out of the congregation that doesn't need to be here. We need to help them. We need to make their job uh, as easy as possible as we can. So I wanted to say that. But this, mo this evening... <clears throat> As the text was, scripture reading was so eloquently read by my son Jalen, uh, Acts chapter 8, the story of, or the account of the eunuch from Ethiopia, and he was traveling to Jerusalem to worship. He was a very noble man, and he was going to worship, but he wasn't saved. He was very religious, but still he wasn't saved. But before he became a Christian, 
you can look at his life from what the scriptures give us, and you can learn a few things from him. Um, and that's what I wanted to point out to you this evening. I think these lessons that I have here uh, that I want to present to you, I believe, I know they've helped me, and I believe that they uh, can help you along in your Christian walk as well. So without further ado, let's get into this. Uh, Acts chapter 8, starting with verse 27. The first lesson that I want to bring to your attention that I learned from the, the eunuch, it was that he was determined to worship God. He was determined to worship God. Look at verse 27. It says, and he arose and went and beheld a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, had come to Jerusalem for to worship. So he wasn't on a business trip. He wasn't out sightseeing. He wasn't on vacation. He wasn't even visiting, visiting family and friends. The Bible says he was going to Jerusalem to worship. But the question may be asked, why would he travel such a great distance from Ethiopia to Jerusalem to worship? You know, I get that question all the time when I invite people out to worship here locally. He's like, where you, where you go to church? I said, I go to church in Chesapeake. Where you live at? Hampton. Why you go so far? It's like, brother, sister, if you knew what I was getting when I got there, you would come too. I tried to persuade them to come if they knew what they were getting. I mean, it's been worth it every single time I come, every single time. But sometimes I get that. Why do you travel so far for worship? Well, the question is asked, why did the eunuch travel so far uh, to go to worship? Well, he was bound by the things of Deuteronomy 16. He was a proselyte to Judaism. So he was bound by the the Feast of the Weeks, the Feast of Tabernacles, uh, the, things that, the things that was in the Law of Moses. He was bound by those things. So he was traveling from Ethiopia to Jerusalem to worship. And I'm not 100% certain, but I think it's reasonable to say that the eunuch had been to Jerusalem to observe both the Passover and Pentecost. And if that's the case, then it's, it's a high probability that he heard some of the things surrounding Jesus's ministry, his, his crucifixion, his miracles, uh, his resurrection, things of that nature. It can't be 100 percent certain, but it's a high probability. But I want to get back to why I say that he was determined to worship God. And I'm pretty sure you you probably won't look at this text ever the same after reading, after hearing this. But had it ever occurred to you how far the eunuch traveled to go to worship? Never occurred to you, probably. You just read that, hey, he traveled from Ethiopia to Jerusalem. When you get your chance, not, not while I'm preaching, don't pull it up right now. When you leave from here, look how far... Ethiopia is from Jerusalem. He traveled over 13 some hundred miles to Jerusalem. I just wanted that to just sink in just for a little bit. He traveled over 1300 miles and it, it gets better. Well, that's just one way. <laughs> just one way. All right. He traveled over 1300 miles and that's no easy trip by today's standards. I don't care whether it's plane, train, bus, sub, car, motorcycle, whatever. 1,300 miles is a long way by no matter what, what standards. But he traveled it. But let me ask you this. Are you willing to travel a great distance to worship God if the opportunity presented itself? Because some of you guys, you know, you live fairly close to the building. I have a 40-minute ride each time I come. It's worth it. Sometimes I do it four times in a week. Sometimes Sunday, twice on Sunday, last to leaders, Wednesday nights. So sometimes you might not see me. It's because the trip gets tiring. 
but I try my best. I make all the sacrifices I can. I do what I can to attend worship or assemble with the saints. And I think that's every opportunity that we have to assemble with the saints. I think we need to make whatever sacrifices we can to do so. Looking at the eunuch and what he did traveling 1,300 miles just one way. But, but let, me, let me clarify some other things. He did it by chariot. I just... I have a brother earnest moment. I just, I just want us to think. I, I, I just want us to think. He did it by chariot. He didn't have tinted windows to keep the sun out. He didn't have automatic start to warm or cool his car if need be. He didn't have the luxuries that we have. You know what I'm saying? Am I, am I, kind of bringing it home for you. He didn't have, uh, uh, what, 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 what can I say? He didn't have the leather seats, the fabric seats. He didn't, he didn't have any of those luxuries in his chariot. Yet and still, he traveled 1,300 miles to Jerusalem to make this trip to worship God. And not only that, I, made, I did some research to find how far they could travel each day, he could only travel like maybe 20 to 25 miles by chariot each day. So if you really do the math, about 1,300 miles, it took him about a month to make this trip to go to worship. This is what the eunuch did in order to worship God. I, I say that's why he's determined to worship God and I think he's a great example in that as, as as to where we should look at his example and be determined to worship God the same way. Now I'm not saying we have to drive 1300 miles, fly 1300 miles every Sunday. I get it. But the determination in which he showed and he wasn't even a Christian, this is what the eunuch did. So I've read that using that mode of travel by chariot at best, you could travel 25, 30 miles a day, 40 if you're really pushing it. So the trip took him about, like I said, it took him about a month. But imagine how grueling this trip was. The hardships, the expenses, the dangers in which he endured to make this trip, but yet and still, he was determined to fulfill his obligation to worship God. And I think assembling with the saints should be a priority for us. We should fill it any time that we have opportunity to, uh, to worship God. We should do the same. So that's the first, the first lesson that I say we can learn uh, from the eunuch. The second lesson is he read the scriptures. Look at verse 28. He read the scriptures. <clears throat> he was returning and sitting in his chariot, and he was reading Isaiah the prophet. So not only was he reading the scriptures. I'm sorry, this is a little inside joke with one of the sisters. My sweat rag, I am so sorry. He was reading the scriptures, but I think it's very impressive in what he was doing on his journey home from worship. He was reading the scriptures on his journey from uh, worship. So that leads me to ask you, you know, what is our attitude or what do we do on our journey home from worship? Do we, do we ask our children, how was Bible class? What did they learn in Bible class when we're on our way home from worship? Do we ask our spouse, you know, what did you take away from the sermon? Or did you learn anything from Bible class? You know, what, what is our attitude when it comes to worship? Do we treat worship like work? After the last amen is said, it's kind of like, I don't want to have anything else to do with church until I have to be that building back again. Do we treat worship that way? Is that our attitude? If it is, you need to repent. That shouldn't be the case. You know, do we uh, at least carry a song 
you know, the song leader leading the songs? Do we at least carry a tune? Do we at least carry a song in our heart through the week after we, uh, after we depart from worship services? We need to be like the eunuch and take advantage of our time, every opportunity we get by reading. Just like he did, we should do the same. Now, he was most likely reading from a scroll. He didn't have the comprised 66, 66 books that we did. He was reading from a scroll, and he was reading aloud. That was how, you know, the eunuch, I mean, Philip had heard him. So someone may ask, you know, why do we have to read so much? You know, uh, doesn't come into worship service or Bible class, doesn't, doesn't that do it enough? No, it doesn't. It's like, are you kidding me? Why, why, why do we have to read so much? First of all, this book came from God. That ought to be reason enough. That should be. But just in case that's not enough, understand that this book answers some of life's greatest questions that no other book can. And what I mean by that is, where we come from? No other book can answer that. Only the Bible can answer that. Where do we come from? Genesis chapter 2 and verse 6, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, man became a living soul. No other book can do that on earth. Where do we come from? Why am I here? No other book can answer that. Only the Bible can. Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. If there is nothing else you do on this earth, you need to fear God and keep his commandments. No other book can tell you to do that. But where do I go when I leave from here? There again, only this book can tell us that. Genesis, Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 7, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. This book can answer all of life's greatest questions. No other book can do it. None that's on earth. So that's why we need to take time to read the scriptures. But not only that, eternal life is found within its pages. Remember what Peter told Jesus in John 6 and verse 68? He said, Lord, where, where, where can we go? You, you have the words to eternal life. That's what Peter told Jesus. So in the, in the scriptures, in this book, is how we find eternal life. <clears throat> and God promises us the way of escape from every temptation. Yeah, I said it. Uh, yeah. God promises us a way of escape, not from some temptation, all temptation. I don't know if you believe me or not, but let's go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13, and let's see what God's book has to say. Yes, God's book, God's scriptures allows us a way of escape from all temptation. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, chapter 10, verse 13, he says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as common unto man. But God is faithful, who would not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but with the temptation also make a way of escape that you may also be able to bear it. God, for one thing, he, you're not going to be faced with something that's, that's unique that no man has never, ever seen before. The same sins in which you're being tempted with, this man over here is being tempted with it too. Nothing's unique. You can't come with some, oh, well, it was just different. This, that, uh, no, no. The book says, there hath no temptation taken you that is uncommon to man. But also it says that God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above anything that you are able so God is going to give you strength. He's, he's got your back. He's, he, he's on your side. And not only that, he always provides a back door. Always. Just like if this room was sin, those two, the exits, he always has it. You just got to look for it. Any instance we see in the scriptures where somebody was tempted, you can always see the situation and where a back door was always there. Some found it. Some didn't. Prime example, Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, his, his thing was he combated Satan with the scriptures, 
God's word. That was how he got out of being tempted by Satan. He, it was with God's word. So God promises a, a way of escape from every temptation. Uh, reading the scriptures, it makes us perfect. Paul told Timothy that in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and verse 17, he says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, instruction, and righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That's another reason why we need to read the scriptures like the eunuch did, because it can make us perfect. Now, God's word is understandable. However, it does not mean that some things aren't easily understood. Some things are harder than others to understand. But God's word is understandable. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 4, whereby when you read, you will understand. So some things take more study. Some things take more research. Some, some things take more reading than others. But just like anything else on earth, if you have trouble with this or if you're having problems with this, what do you do if you're having problems? You ask somebody. There's no excuse why anyone in this room has problems with finding answers in the scriptures because we got a lot of knowledge in this room here. We do. But just like anything else, if you have problems with finding something, you just ask. Which brings me to our next point with the eunuch. He asked a question. Look at verse 30, 31, 34. He wasn't too proud to ask. He, he had misunderstood some things, so what did he do? He asked Philip, I pray thee, whom the prophet is talking about, himself or someone else. Oh, I got to get back to the text. I'm sorry. Acts chapter 8. He asked a question. So everyone should do this when they don't understand a question or when they have problems with something. They should ask a question. Over the years when I've, I've done studies with people or just have discussions with people, you know, at work, on the street, or whatever the case may be, I've always welcomed an honest answer or honest question about the scriptures. You know, it shows that someone has a noble or honest heart. We see that in Luke, 8, Luke chapter 8, verses 15, with the parable of the sower and the seed. And if such an attitude is necessary to one that wants to be saved, they have to have an open and honest heart in order to accept God's word. Uh, James chapter 1 and verse 21, it says that we're to be able to receive with meekness the implanted or the engrafted word which is able to save our souls. And then we see that on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2 and verse 41, those, on, those that there on Pentecost, those that had crucified Jesus and Peter was up there preaching, these men, they wanted to know what they needed to do to be saved. He said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter says, uh, repent and be baptized, those, uh, every one of you, but those who gladly receive the word on the day of Pentecost, uh, they were saved. So various reasons for various reasons why, I don't know, people, they just don't answer questions. I mean, they don't ask questions. Whether they're fearful, they're timid, or just plain out arrogance. Some people just don't ask questions. But uh, many are afraid. But they shouldn't be. Uh, when it comes to your soul's salvation, you should never be afraid to ask a question about the scriptures. And then remember, asking an honest question from the scriptures is always a good thing. And this is what the eunuch did when he didn't understand what he was reading. And so we should never be willing to not be satisfied until our questions are answered concerning uh, the scriptures. The fourth thing that I learned from the eunuch Verses 35 and verse 36, he heard preaching and he applied it to himself. He heard preaching and he applied it to himself. Now, wouldn't you, I would have liked to have been a silent partner 
during this study with Philip and the eunuch. Just, you know, how you go out in two sometimes and you do a Bible study and one person does all the talking and then you have a silent partner. I wish I could have just been a silent partner and just, just heard the conversation. I mean, I know we got some of it written here, but not everything that was said is written here. But at least we have Philip's outline in which he preached. The Bible says he preached unto him Jesus. He had a one-point sermon outline. But if you look at when he was in Samaria, if you want to know what his outline was in verse 12, it says that he was preaching in Samaria. They believed him concerning the things, the kingdom of Jesus, the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. He had a two point sermon outline that time. So but preaching is very important and it is not easy by a long slide. You see why I'm sweating up here. I'm sweating bullets. Preaching is not easy at all. But not only is it an avenue of worship for us, it's a tool that God has used to get his message across to those who want to be saved. And there's many purposes for preaching, but four of them that I like to point out tonight is that uh, preaching is used to discuss and explain the scriptures. It presents Christ as our hope. It's uh, to tell men how to be saved, and it also helps Christians to stay saved and to help them to grow. Now, it's every gospel preacher's earnest hope that those listening to the sermon would have soft hearts and make personal application of the lesson to themselves. But oftentimes, folks will hear a sermon and they don't apply it to themselves. They are thinking about somebody else. They are thinking about applying it to somebody else. They're like, if you hear a preacher preaching on a certain thing, and it was like, man, where's sister so-and-so? She needs to hear this. Or I hope my husband's listening. He needs to hear this. Or where's sister and brother so-and-so? They going through this. They need to be here hearing this sermon. Brethren, we can't be that way. Philip, when he heard the sermon, the eunuch, when he heard the sermon from Philip, he applied it to himself. He didn't say, well, I'm going to take this back to Ethiopia and show this to the queen and everybody else there. He didn't do that. He applied the sermon to himself, which I think we need to do when we hear a sermon. We need to apply it to ourselves. But look at what Isaiah said in 60, Isaiah 66 in verse 2, when it comes to the heart and God's word. He says, but on this one I will look, on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit, and who trembles at my word. The eunuch had such a spirit. When he heard the word, when he heard the preaching, he applied it to himself. But how do we know that? Well, because he was willing to make personal application of Philip's sermon uh, to himself. And we see that in verse 36. It says, as, as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? So he came to a certain water and Philip baptized him. So we need to be ever vigilant, vigilant when we main, to maintain a soft, pliable heart when it comes to God's word. And the proverbial writer, he wrote in Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23, he says, keep your heart with all diligence for what? Out of it springs the issues of life. And there's a, a few... Uh, Scriptures in Psalm 119 that the psalmist wrote uh, that applies to our heart when it comes to God's word and the heart. He says in Psalm 119, verse 11, he says, your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Uh, Psalm 119 and verse two, blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart. In Psalm 119 and verse 36, he says, incline mine ear to your testimonies. So we all need to imitate the eunuch in this regard. We need to apply the lesson to ourselves. Next lesson that we learn from the eunuch, he confessed his faith and he was baptized. The eunuch confessed his faith, and he was baptized. 
Now the eunuch was ready to be saved, and he knew that something was required of him, but he needed to make it official. He had heard the gospel, he believed the gospel, he was ready to confess his faith in Jesus, and Philip asked him, did he believe with all his heart? And he said that he did. He said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he said that he believed that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. But notice what he didn't say. I believe that I'm already saved. <laughs> he didn't say that. He didn't, he didn't say, uh, well, I think I'm already saved. And when I get back to Ethiopia, then I'll be baptized. He didn't say that. So Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, in verse 32, whosoever confesses, confess me before men, him will I also confess before my Father, which is in heaven. Whosoever therefore shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. Romans 10 and verse 10, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now, with this confession, it's not just the formality to just say uh, something before mankind. When you make this confession, you're acknowledging that you're a lost sinner and that there's no other hope on earth for you but Jesus Christ. When you confess Jesus before man, that's what you're acknowledging. You're acknowledging that Jesus is declared to be the son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Romans chapter one and verse four. And you're acknowledging that Jesus is the only head of the church and the only savior of the body. Ephesians 5 and verse 23. And upon this confession, you're also acknowledging that Jesus is the only one that is the qualified one to add to the church. Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord is the one that adds to the church daily, those who are being saved. So upon the eunuch's confession of faith, verse 38, the eunuch stopped the chariot. And this is an important point right here. In verse 38, it says that the eunuch commanded the chariot to stand still. Why do I say it's important? Because if Philip had stopped the chariot, he would have been forcing the eunuch to be baptized. But the eunuch he saw and believed what Philip was preaching. So he commanded the chariot to stand still. That's how you knew he got what Philip was preaching. Those are the best types of lessons. When people, they be like, look, I, I want to be baptized right now. When they tell you that they got it, when they want to be baptized, that's how you know they got it. And that's what happened here. Philip did a good job in teaching them. He says that the unit commanded the chariot uh, to stop, and Philip baptized him. And the eunuch realized that he was lost, and the only way that he could do something about it was to stop the chariot and to be baptized. So the question is, why didn't the eunuch just wait until he got back home to be baptized? He knew that he was in sin, and he needed to do something about it. He saw the importance of it. He saw the urgency of it. He saw that he needed to be baptized right then and there, just like in Acts 20, chapter 22 and verse 16, arise and why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So the eunuch wanted to get that sin off of him. So he hurried to be baptized. He saw the urgency. It's just like if you were in a parking lot and you're about to go in the store to go grocery shopping or something like that. You get out of the car, you see $200 bills on the ground, and you say, like, well, I'm going to go in the store and do my shopping, and I'll come back and get them when I come out. You're not going to do that, are you? You see the value. You see the importance. You see the urgency. Those $200 bills might not be back when you come back. So you're going to pick them up right away. It's the same with baptism. When you realize that you're in sin, you see the urgency of it. You don't wait a day. You don't wait a week. You do it right then. It doesn't matter what time of the night. It doesn't matter what time of the day. You can call your elders 2.30, 3 o'clock, they'll do it. To put a soul in Christ, they will get up and they will do it. Trust me. So the eunuch, he saw the urgency. He knew he needed to be baptized, and so he was. And so when you learn that baptism is not a physical, it's not a physical bath, well, it is a physical bath, but it has 
spiritual result, results. It's not, a, it's not putting away the filth of the flesh, but it's the answer of a good conscience toward God. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21. Romans 6 and 3, Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. Know you not that so many of, so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ, we were baptized into his death. And then what happened to Jesus on the cross? He shed his blood and his death. So when you're baptized, that's when you contact the blood of Christ. That's the only thing that can wash your sins away. So when you're buried with Christ in baptism, you're buried into his death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Baptism is an, emergent, is an immersion that both when they both went down into the water. Baptism is a burial. Baptism is not a sprinkling or a pouring. Baptism is not for the, it's for the remission of sins, Acts 2.38. And baptism puts one into Christ, Galatians 3, verse 27. So the eunuch, he let nothing hinder him from being baptized. And I'm going to drop this while I'm flying. Brother Smith's not here. He didn't let his position of authority, he didn't let his past or his pride hinder him from being baptized. And sometimes those three can hurt us or hinder us from being baptized. Uh, you may be some, a prominent member in society, your position of authority. Some of us may look at our past like, oh, my past is not, is not the best. They might let that hinder them from being baptized. Sometimes we can be too prideful to go in a watery grave to be baptized. But the, hint, the, the eunuch here, he did not let either one of those hinder him from being baptized. And don't forget, they were in a desert place. But the eunuch was willing, he was searching, and God presented water there for them. Even though they were, in a, they were in a desert place, God took care of him because his heart was in the right place, and he wanted him to be saved, and he wanted to be saved. And perhaps you're here tonight, and you need to be saved, just like the eunuch. You can, you've heard the gospel. You need to repent of your sins. You need to confess the name of Christ before man. And you need to be baptized in a watery grave so you can be baptized into Christ to wash away your sins, to crucify the old man. You can be added to the Lord's church and you can, you can arise out of that water and go away rejoicing just like the eunuch did here in, cha in Acts chapter 8. Perhaps you have done this and you've strayed away. God offers a second law of pardon for those who have sinned. And they need to come back to the fold. If there's sin in your life, is there something that you're struggling with? Uh, you can come forward. We can help you. The elders can pray for you. If, you're, if you need to become saved, if you want to become a Christian, please come now as together we stand and we sing the song that's selected.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, hallowed be thy name. We pray that in all things your will be done. Lord, again, we're so thankful for this wonderful Lord's Day you've given us. We're thankful for the opportunity we've had to hear these two great lessons. We pray that we'll take these things and apply them to our lives and become better servants of thine in this upcoming week. Heavenly Father, there are many that are sick and afflicted. We're praying for, and we pray that they'll be returned to their state of natural health and be thy will. We pray for those who are traveling, Heavenly Father, and those who are suffering loss, bereavement. Heavenly Father, we thank thee so much for your son, Jesus Christ. We know without his sacrifice, we'd have no hope of eternal life. We pray, Heavenly Father, we'll never forget the magnitude of that sacrifice he made for us. And we'll be, de be determined to live our lives in such a way that uh, we'll be pleasing to thee and a servant to our man to fellow man, so they may also come to want to know your, your son and be, be freed of their sins as well. Heavenly Father, we love thee so much. We ask you to forgive us of our sins. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.